Okay, welcome everyone. Um, my name is Amy Ritterbush. I'm the chair of the Growth Study Committee. And just wanted to welcome you to our first public forum. We've been gathering a lot of data this fall, and so we're eager to show it to you and then get your feedback at the end. We're going to have about a 20 minute presentation by Chuck Joseph, and then we're going to break into small groups, to, uh, and we have some discussion questions to do, and you'll be with a, a few people, a um, few members of the committee in your group. So I'll just introduce the members of the committee here. So we have uh, Finn Perry, who is the vice chair over here. Um, we have Muriel Kramer, who's our clerk. She's over there. Yep. Okay, and Chuck Joseph, one of our Chamber of Commerce reps. Frandy Young, over here. Uh, Tim Brennan, Michelle Murdoch, David Wheeler, and Wilson St. Pierre. All right, thanks everyone for coming. I'm going to turn it over to Chuck, Chuck now. Thank you, Amy. Thanks, everybody, for being here this evening. We're going to try to move through the data part pretty quickly here um, so that we can get you guys into discussions. And our purpose here tonight really is to kind of uh, inform you of some of the things we've learned as we've been gathering the data. We all think, uh, because some of us have a history at the town, that we have a good picture of it. And you find out that you kind of do and you kind of don't. Uh, and as you, as you learn and, and have this data as a background for your discussions, I hope, hope it's going to be helpful for you. I want to thank HCAM for uh, broadcasting this tonight so that uh, folks who couldn't make it will be able to, uh, they won't participate with us this evening, but they'll be able to catch the data as well. Usually when I'm in this building with HCAM, I'm doing some kind of athletic contest, so it's really nice to be down here where it's a little quieter. They do have me tethered in with a wire, so I tend to wander, so I, I'll, I'm pretty sure I'll yank the screen down at one point, but we'll, we'll work with that when we get there. All right, so Amy, if you're ready, we can, we can start to go through. We're going to try to give you the big picture here tonight. Uh, our population currently is about 17,644. That's as of 1021. We could have a few more since then, but it's good to keep these numbers in your head because they do relate to uh, other stuff later as we start to compare ourselves to other communities. Um, next slide, we have about 6,543 households. So that's apartments, condos, single families, um, and that's as up to date as we could possibly get it as of two or three days ago. Okay. Uh, our school population has very recently come in at 3,978. We'll be talking more about that. Go ahead. Uh, we have uh, 3,537 students from uh, the town outside of the new construction at Legacy. Legacy has contributed 441 students. So what we did is we wanted to say, well, how does that 441 compare to 717 units on a ratio? That's about 0.62 students per household, which is ex almost exactly emblematic of the rest of the town, which has a 0.6 students per household. So the actual rate of students per household is mirrored in legacy as it is in the rest of the town. That's not what you're hearing. So that's a really important piece of data for us to have. Go ahead. Our budget is $93 million. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll be talking a little bit about that later. And the educational portion of that budget is $48 million. Uh, we're at about 55% of our budget being uh, directed towards the schools. So where does the money come from? About $60 million comes from residential taxes, $12 million from commercial and industrial, $10 million from state aid, $13 million from other local revenues, and there's a whole series of, of that in there, personal property, et cetera, uh, and those are from the local receipts. So when you look at it on a pie graph, you get to see that we are a residential town. All right, we have 84% of our revenue comes from residential, 16% comes from commercial industrial. Um, many years ago when Finn and I were working on committees and the dinosaurs were here, we were probably around 25% commercial industrial, but as the town grew, it grew primarily as a residential community, and that is in fact uh, dictated pretty much by our zoning bylaws now. How do we compare with neighboring towns? Uh, Population-wise, people always, this, this always cracks me up, people are always surprised at this. So Westboro's real close to us, Hollison's a little less, Milford's obviously more, Ashland's just about identical, Upton's Upton, and Southboro and Holliston. So you get to have an idea, all right, as to how it goes. What's interesting here is the percentage of the entire population that are school children, 
all right? The perception, the public perception out there is that half of our population must be kids, all right? It just seems like that. Watch the school buses, my God. But in fact, 23% of our population, and if you look at the other towns, we're a little bit on the high side. We always have been, all right? So that has not changed, that percentage, and it's a good thing to keep in the back of your mind. Uh, in terms of percentage of entire town budget that goes to schools, again, we are very, very characteristic of regional communities. It, 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 it's, we're not dissimilar. We are very much in line with what you see going on around us. Um, my business, I have nine offices, we cover 28 towns. All of them complain about their towns, all right, and they're all pretty similar. People think if I move from this town to this town, I'm going to save a million dollars in taxes. And it's pretty similar when you get there. Go ahead. The percentage of the population that's over 55, again, the western metro west suburbs are very synchronized in the, in the division of their populations. There's not one that's, uh, there's no real big outliers there. Go ahead, Amy. And the percentage that's over 65. Interestingly enough, we're on the slower side of this. We're on the lower side of this. So I think if you ask the demographer, we probably skew a little bit towards a younger population, but our, the breakdown of our age brackets is not dissimilar from other towns around us. How do we compare to peer towns? Now, before we do this, I want to tell you, peer towns, we were snobs in doing this. And we said, let's just look at other towns with good school systems. And let's see if, and this is a completely subjective criteria. You can put your own schools in here, all right? But we just picked some and said, let's just see how that looks. And when you look at the age of school children, it was scary similar. It was between 21 and 23% across the board. So when you're looking at these towns, Acton, Concord, Medfield, Sharon, Sudbury, Wayland, Westboro, Westwood, and West Ford, you know, they're mirror images. They're, they're very, very similar. And then when you look at the breakout of commercial versus residential, we actually have more commercial than most of those peer towns, which surprised me. I, I, I thought we were really on the low end, and it turns out we're not. So when you look at per pupil expenditures, you can see where the first bar graph over there, um, you know, it is what it is. Concord's up there, Wayland's up there. Uh, what they're spending on, you'd have to really get into the intricacies of their school budgets to see what that goes on. But again, as you look at all of the data, because we're pulling this data from everywhere, and as you look at all this data, here we are. We are a Metro West town. That's what we are. Go ahead. Uh, debt, debt compared to at, uh, the annual budget. Uh, I don't know what Acton's doing, man, but they, they're not building anything, all right? But the rest of us, we're kind of 11, 7, 11, 12, 3 in Sudbury, 9, 9, 6, 7, 9. So we're on the high end of the debt, but if you run through your head, the buildings that have been built here since 1995, if you look at that time period, that 25-year time period, we have built a ton of municipal buildings, school buildings, et cetera. So this does not surprise us that that, that number is where it is. A bit of history. Uh, here's our population growth from 1990 in five-year chunks. So everybody thinks in the last 10 years we have exploded. You should have been here in the 90s, man. In the 90s, we were growing at 17%, 25% population growth in five-year periods. So yes, our numbers are bigger on a percentage basis because our absolute numbers are higher. However, if you look at it on a percentage basis, we have actually slowed down. And that is typical as towns get built out. As towns get built out, the building slows down, the population starts to slow down. Population change on a percentage basis with actual numbers of the, the number of uh, citizens who uh, were added to the population here in Hopkinton. You can see how that, how that moves. And some of this you have to relate back to recessions, non-recessions, et cetera, because that does influence everything from birth rates to construction rates. Uh, this, I happen to love this chart 
most people could care less, but I kind of like it. Because I was here and, and working in the, in the real estate industry back in the 80s and all the way through here. And the thing I want you to just look at is the ratio of green to orange. Orange is uh, condominiums, green are single family homes. So when you look at it, you can see that from 89 to probably 06, we were really primarily building single family homes with a few condo projects. In 13, 12, 13, you see the orange bar grow tremendously. That's legacy. So that's the influence of legacy right there. The blue are two large apartment complexes, the one at Legacy and the one down at Modera. And of course, they're done in a very short period of time, so they tend to, to spike in terms of the number of units that go up. Okay? So what have we done to manage this growth? Um, I will tell you that based on my experience, this town is extraordinarily well managed. It has its issues like every other town. It, it, you just can't get away from that when you're governing a municipality. However, I want to point out a few things that have occurred during my tenure here that I think probably influenced the reasons that you moved here. We preserved open space and rural character. That was a big deal, and back in 1988, we passed a zoning bylaw called the Open Space Planning Development, I forget what it's called, but fundamentally what it did is say, it told builders, it was a public-private partnership, and it told builders, you can build houses closer together if you give all the surrounding land to open space. And you can't just give the crappy land. You can't give just all wetland and all that other stuff. And what happens now is we are a town that geographically is 27 square miles. We are a very, very large community. We are not very densely populated because the largest landowner in town is the state of Massachusetts. And the second largest landowner is the town of Hopkinton. Because of that open space bylaw that was passed as a public-private co-venture, we now have over one square mile of open space that has resulted from that type of development. So when you drive around and you see wonderful homes and then you see a lot of open space, it didn't happen by accident. There was planning that was involved in that. I remember in, uh, I, don't, I forget what year it was, 1990s, when we bought the Terry Farm. And this is the Terry Farm, where it was sitting on the Terry Farm, kind of. And then the Hopkins was here. And it was a controversial thing. What are we buying this 100 acres for? What are we doing? Blah, 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 blah. Well, then we looked ahead and said, my goodness, this is really happening. We need a couple of schools. We need a bunch of athletic fields. And all of a sudden, we turned into geniuses because we bought this land. And I think what happens is when the town makes these decisions at town meetings, the really good decisions tend to get buried as if they always happened and they were just here. And people don't realize that the citizens at those times made very conscious planning and management decisions that ended up in the community that we love today. That was, it was not, it just didn't happen. So with that, I don't know if I want to get into a whole bunch of these things. Uh, we did do a whole lot of building. I think you all know where they are. We built some schools. We built Hopkins. We built Marathon. We built this high school. We built the DPW. We built the library. We built the police station. We built the fire station. We built the senior center. Uh, you know, we built some stuff. And uh, the last time this town went through a building spurt like this was 1895 to, to 1905. And it was the last time they experienced a population boom with the shoe factories. And they built what is today the library. They built what is today our town hall. They built what was the high school and is now the building in front of Carrigan Park. They, did, they went through a building boom the same way. And they incurred debt to do it the same way. So, you know, it's not like we're the first people to do this. All right, but I, I think that the point to be made is this data starts to give you a framework from which to make future decisions going forward. Okay, so what does the future look like? Uh, we have, so, Legacy is a real anomaly. We had, I want to say, mm, 5,700 housing units when Legacy started, maybe 56. And we permitted, through the master plan, 950 units to be built there. We permitted 20% increase in housing. And it's been being built out over six years. There's about two more years of construction there. All right, so it's really important for us to think in those terms. That's like the python that swallowed the pig. You know, it kind of came through and, it, and it, it skewed our numbers in a way that will never be skewed again. You're never going to see another project like that. 
but it is an anomaly that we have to deal with in terms of what are the unforeseen ramifications of that. So if you, um, did I miss a slide in here? Okay, let me just go back to that one for one second. There's also the, the trails, which is up at the top of the hill by the gas tanks. That's 175 units that have been permitted that are 55 and older. So that tends to act like commercial development in the sense that there will be a significant tax base that will come from that, but it will not impact the 55% of our budget that is schools. So that tends to work in our favor. So this is, what am I looking at here? Oh, these are, this is Legacy Farms. So this is, these are the build outs from 2013 till now. This is just specifically Legacy Farms. Uh, and you can see that over here in the green, the 717 units that are completed, owner, uh, certified, occupied, et cetera. There's 228, the orange, that are to be built. And then there's the 175 blue, which is the age-restricted uh, trails project that, that will happen. That build out, uh, according, if it, if it proceeds the way it has been proceeding, will probably be somewhere between 18 and 30 months um, to finish building that out. Yes? Can we, can we see that as a balancing thing? So we have 0.62 students yes. for the 228. Yes. And now we have 175 homes that won't have students at all. Yes. Okay, so if I understand the question, we're saying is the tax base going to balance out the cost of the students? Well, as it so happens, uh, Legacy Farms pays way more than its share of schools. All right, let me give you an example. In the last five years, the Hopkinton Town budget has increased approximately 5% a year. So we've gone, I think it was, I forget what it was. Uh, maybe 2016, I, I can't remember exactly, but we've, we've increased by $19 million over this period of six, seven, eight years, something like that. Oh, five years, I guess it was. And the new construction money that has come in has been exactly 50% of the increase of our growth. So if our budget has gone up 19 million over those five or six years, our new construction money has gone up 10.5 million. So it's way more than paid for the cost of those school children. It, you could make the argument that it has funded a lot of the building that has gone on. The challenging part for the future as we look forward in two years when that building subsides and goes back down to normal rates, we're not going to be collecting that 2 million, 2.2 million a year every year. What's going to happen to our budget? That's the topic for a little bit later. Go ahead. So the percentage of uh, uh, students, Hopkins Public School students of the total population, you can see this historically, it has been unbelievably consistent all the way up. So the ratio of school children to our general population hasn't changed. Our population has changed. The legacy farms enrollment, oh yeah. So this is a little bit of a deceptive slide. So I wanna, I wanna kinda see if I can demystify some things here. Our non-legacy children in our schools, and I don't even like doing this, I think this is unfair, but our non-legacy children has been very consistent. But it hasn't been. So if you look from 2009 till 2020, this year, this October, it actually dipped for quite a while during the recession, etc. And in the last couple of years, we're starting to see an increase above the norm in the number of children that are enrolling in school, not from legacy, but from the resale of homes. It is extraordinarily difficult to predict that. It is very hard to say where is that going to go over the next 10 years. How many children are going to move, move into this house if that house sells and how many kids are graduating? It's a very complex thing. I've worked, been working with the superintendent's office and trying to get our arms around these numbers. We do know it's going to grow. We know we're probably going to be looking at another 200 students or so once legacy is completed. We don't know if there's going to be a continued growth in the number of children enrolling b due to the resale of homes. So we have 6,500, I think that was the number, wasn't it? 6,500 households here. We turn over about 320, 325 houses a year annually in Hopkinton. 
So what happens in the churning of those 300 houses? How many kids come? How many don't come? It, it's going to vary from year to year, but you must remember with the school ratings that we have had in the past five years, three to five years, we are a magnet for parents who are concerned about their children's education. And if, the, and I, now I work in this industry, and I will tell you, they will come to this community and buy a lesser home to get their kids into this school. So what that means for the future, uh, it, it, we're working on it. We don't know. Nobody's going to be able to tell you exactly. If they do, they're lying. So these are, uh, one of the things that compounded the problem for the school department also is that there's, a, there's an organization called NESDEC that does a lot of uh, projections, and they have undershot our enrollment uh, seriously for quite some time. So we're now in a situation where, you know, there's also another organization, um, the funding, H, what is it called? Superintendent Kavanaugh, what's it called? The H, the funding mechanism for new schools, the organization. MSBA. MSBA. The MSBA has their formula for how they reimburse you and how big a school you can build. So you build according to their formula or the local town decides, well, we're going to pay above and beyond that to get a bigger school. So there's, there's, there's some issues that are going to be coming up in terms of our growth, and some of it will be related to public school growth. Uh, oh, this is the facility's capacity. Um, we have fire and safety. Chief Slamman's here tonight. Superintendent Kavanaugh's here from the schools. They're going to take part in our discussion groups as well. So we have capacity for schools. We have uh, a, a growing town of 27 square miles. When do we need another fire station? When do we not need another fire station? Those are all topics that are going to be discussed at town meeting. There's going to be study committees on that. We are, we are dealing with good problems. You know, I know that people don't like to hear that when it's going to cost them more money. But it is going to cost us more money. And we are going to be dealing with problems that are going to be defined over the next three to five years. Uh, what else we got? The other thing that the committee, the growth study committee, is going to be looking at, we, we've been meeting since the midsummer, I think it is, and we're gathering as much data as we can and pulling it all together and trying to make sense out of it. And we've got a wonderful group of people that are doing great work. Um, but we still have a lot of work to do. Uh, uh, among that is we have to identify parcels of land and what the potential development capabilities of those are and try to predict that out. Um, I do this for a living and I'll tell you it's not that easy to do. Uh, you, you know, so much of it is dependent upon forces outside of our town that have to do when things get developed, how they get developed, if it can be because of economic purposes. But we're going to try to come back to the town with some coherent data uh, around those issues. Anything else? Oh, commercial industrial. So we have 16%, is that right? Yeah, 16% yeah, uh, of our tax base is commercial industrial. Um, as you know, our forefathers were wonderfully inclined to zone along 495, which was a great, great move for them way back when. We have some downtown. We have a couple of little pockets here and there. Uh, we're probably not going to be rezoning land into commercial industrial. I don't think that's the tenor of the town. I don't think that's where the town wants to go. We do have to be aware from an economic development standpoint that we need to preserve that 16%. We don't want to see some of that disappear. And there are a myriad of reasons why that could happen. The various lives of corporate entities, um, whether or not our, the office market holds up. You know, the office market is very weak right now. Uh, if it's not, if the uses that we have zoned for on South Street are not uh, uh, in line with what the market demands? Are we willing to change some of that zoning to keep that 16% there? It's possible we could increase that 16%. We're not going to increase it by, I don't believe the town has the, has the inclination to increase it by expanding the zoning, but it's very possible with our, we have rezoned South Street to go to four stories, I believe it is in some areas. We have hotel overlay districts. So there could be changes. There was a recent building down on, um, What's the one that Victor did down there? Uh, they just they took an old building that had been mothballed for years and they renovated the whole thing and leased it all out and increased our tax base by doing that. So that's one way you can increase the commercial industrial tax base without changing your zoning is to is to upgrade the quality of the buildings and the the intensity of the of the use there. So what we're going to do now? I hope I know I went fast, but what are you going to do? Um, so. I'm hopeful that we can break out into groups of maybe eight or ten.
We'll have uh, growth study committee members at each table. What would be helpful to us and what is part of our mission is to hear what you are concerned about. We thought the 20 minutes or so here would be helpful in kind of laying a basis so that you have a sense of where we are as a community and you can start to generate thoughts about questions that you have. We need to hear that and we need to hear it not only tonight but on an ongoing basis as we work towards town meeting in May. Yes, Mary. Sure. Dell is a large percentage of the tax base in that 16 percent? Yeah, the question is how big of the, ta of the commercial industrial 16 percent is Dell? Uh, Dell is our largest taxpayer all right, in, the, in the town. Uh, as we all know, they, they're undergoing some changes. Uh, we don't have any magical insight into what their corporate plans are. They're pretty tight-lipped about it. But I think it's something that the town has to proactively address. Okay. Mm -hmm. Something that's been on the minds of a lot of people. Yes. Yes, we, we just brought in uh, a biotech company, Lycan, who is renovating one of the dormant buildings up there and using that. Um, if we can continue to be proactive in reaching out and bringing in some of those younger uh, uh, industries, I think, I think we'll be able to maintain our tax base, our commercial industrial tax base. And I also want to know if you looked at, because um, you talked about the commercial, we want to keep it at 16% important part of our tax base, but Lycan, I think, got tax breaks. Yes. And if you look, as we want to attract more business in that 16%, um, is there any way to look at how much the positive impact it may or may not have because we give them tax breaks to come sure. in? So the, the question that Mary's bringing up is when you give a, a, a commercial entity a TIF uh, or an incentive, a tax incentive to come to the town, which basically says you give them tax relief for a certain amount of time to encourage their investment, both infrastructure and uh, uh, in a human resources sense, to bring people into town. Uh, most of the time, you will find that those are rather short-lived, three to five years usually, and then that tax base kicks in, and it kicks in at a much... Uh, a much more improved rate from that dormant building that had been sitting there for a long time. All right, but anyway, thank you all for coming. You can feel free to leave notes or comments as you leave if you want.